بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين وصلى الله وسلم وبارك على المبعوث رحمة للعالمين نبينا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين Dear brothers and sisters in Islam السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته and welcome to this new episode of Ask Huda being broadcasted to you live from Cairo, Egypt and I give my gratitude and thanks to my brother, Dr. Muhammad Salah, uh, uh, the Honorable Sheikh, for allowing me to fill in for him for tonight. May Allah Azza wa Jal increase his knowledge and give him all the good of this dunya and of akhirah, and you, dear viewers, as well. Ameen. You will find the numbers, as usual, displayed at the bottom of the screen, and we have a number of questions through the email, Mustafa, he says, does a wife have to cook for her husband? What does Islam say about a wife who does not want to cook for her husband? The issue of a wife serving her husband is debatable. And it's an issue of dispute among scholars since a very long, long time, as most of these issues. However, without going into details, if we look at the Institute of Marriage itself, it is very difficult to draw the line as obligations and rights. So I will not give you your rights until you do your obligations. And she says, I'll not give you your rights until you fulfill your obligations as well. This is a marriage bound to failure. And definitely this is not the right way of communicating and living. So if we would like to know how to handle these things, we have to go back to the best of generations, to the best time of humanity, and that is the time of the Prophet alayhi salatu the most authentic opinion is that a woman is obliged to serve her husband and her children. And that is it. She is not obliged to serve her in-laws, her father and mother-in-law. This is not her duty. But she is obliged to serve her husband. And you can see this clearly in a number of hadiths where the Prophet addresses Aisha and the rest of his wives by saying, prepare food for us, bring the food to us. In the hadith of Asma bint Abi Bakr, who was married to Az-Zubair ibn al-Awwam, may Allah be pleased with them all, she says that I used to cater for Az-Zubair's horse, and I used to feed the horse and take care of him. And I would travel to bring him the necessary food and to, to take care of that horse. If you look, at the hadith of Fatima, the daughter of the Prophet ﷺ, who used to work in her house until it affected the softness of her hands. So she went to the Prophet ﷺ seeking a slave to help her in the shores of the house. The Prophet ﷺ did not tell her, why should you do this? You're not obliged to work. No. He told her, I will teach you something if you say it it would be better for you than a servant. So from all of this, we learn, we understand that a woman is obliged to serve her husband. Now, if she says, no, I'm not obliged to serve him, in this case, the husband may say, okay, I'm only obliged to give you shelter, which is a house, to clothe you, so I'll buy you one garment a year, and to feed you, and I'll bring you the food on the table. That is it. I'm not obliged to do anything else. Would marriage move on? Would it be full of compassion and love? 
or would it be something like a feud between two partners in a losing transaction or partnership? This is definitely not the right way of doing it. I believe we have a caller, uh, Sister Aisha from Zimbabwe. Assalamu wa rahmatullah. My question is, does Inhuma have to say the takbir in every compulsory prayer? She has to do what? The ikama in all compulsory prayer. Okay, I will answer you inshallah, Sister Aisha. Uh, Brother Hamid from Saudi. Okay. Brother Hamid. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah sheikh. Wa alaikum assalam wa rahmatullah wa barakatuh. I have a couple of questions. Yes. There's a hadith uh, which says that uh, Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa before his death and he was uh, uh, seriously having running high fever. And then he asked his, some companions to come up and uh, tell me if I have run any excess, uh, committed any excess on you. And one of the companions came and then the, he asked him that you, you hit me in the back and then finally he uncovered his back just to see the seal of prophethood uh, on, on the back of Rasulullah Sallallahu This is one, one reason of this. But second reason could be, which, which, which some reporters say that, uh, he, he did it to, sh to, 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 to see whether the justice was uh, established uh, by the Sula system on that day. So is it both, both these things are there, only that he wanted to see the seal of prophethood? Okay. Second question? Second question is that my wife, uh, actually we, we know that after Salat al Maghrib, it's not uh, I mean, uh, recommended for the ladies to go out uh, in the evening. Uh, but my wife wants to do it, uh, do, uh, I mean, go uh, on an evening walk with me after Salat and Kisha. Can she do it? Okay. Any more questions, Zakhamid? Okay. okay, okay. Thank you so much. Jazakallah khair. Wa jazak, my friend. Uh, Sister Om Hamza from Saudi. Okay, I, thought, I think we've lost Sister Om Hamza. Uh, Sister Aisha from Zimbabwe says that what's uh, the ruling on offering iqama for every salat, for fat salat for uh, 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 females, for sisters? And the answer is this is not part of the sunnah. A adhan and iqama is to be performed by men. And some scholars, and I am inclined to this opinion, recommend that if a woman is alone or in the presence of only women and they would like to pray far prayer, it is permissible for them to do iqama because iqama is for the prayer itself, not to be announced. While adhan can only be done by men. And even if she was in an area where no one had called the adhan, the adhan she is not to do it because this would be an innovation. So, Iqama is an issue dispute. Inshallah, if you do it, there is nothing wrong in that. Hamid from Saudi Arabia, he is, it appears to me, that he's mixed between two stories. The story of Salman al Farisi, who is the truth seeker who left Persia to Iraq to Sham, going from one place to the other, trying to reach the correct and authentic religion of Allah. He accompanied and served many monks, many priests, and finally he was told about a place which fits the description of Medina, and that the prophet, who is the seal of prophethood, would be uh, uh, appearing, and this is his era. So he was sold as a slave to uh, uh, a Jew, who was residing in Medina. When he heard of the coming of the Prophet ﷺ, he went to him and he gave him food. And he told him that this is charity, sadaqah. So the Prophet ﷺ did not eat from it. And he asked his companions to eat from it. The following day, he brought some more food, saying that this is a gift. So the Prophet ate from it. ﷺ. So he realized that this is the description of the Prophet ﷺ, as in the scriptures. So he tried to come from behind the Prophet ﷺ to see 
the seal of the prophethood, which is in the size of an egg, a small egg, and it's between the prophet's shoulders, alayhi salatu wasalam. So the prophet recognized that he was trying to do this, so he took off his shirt, and Salman saw it, and he fell on that seal of prophethood, kissing it. May Allah be pleased with him. This is a story, and there's another story of a companion when the prophet was preparing the rose for battle, sallallahu alayhi wasallam, and the prophet had a small stick, a branch of a tree, and he was just uh, 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 correcting and trying to even the rose. So as he was doing this, one of the companions shouted, said, Ouch, O Prophet of Allah, you hurt me in my stomach. And this is not fair. I'd like to make, uh, 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 to take even or to be even with you. So the Prophet, I'm being fair and just, uncovered uh, uh, his uh, uh, stomach and he said, Go ahead. Uh, 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 take justice with your own hands and do to me as I did to you. Though the Prophet didn't do anything and wasn't intending to harm the man, the minute the man saw this, he embraced the Prophet's stomach, alayhi salatu wasalam, putting his face onto it and kissing it. And the Prophet saying, what are you doing? He said, oh Prophet of Allah, forgive me. You didn't hurt me. But I wanted the last thing before I face my death in battle, before Allah accepts me as a martyr, inshallah, I wanted the last thing to touch my body is your body. And the man died as a martyr. So I believe that Brother Hamid got these uh, two stories confused and Allah knows best. We have a caller, Brother Noor from Nigeria. Hello. Yes, Brother Good evening. Noor. Good evening, Sheikh. Assalamu alaikum. Wa alaikum assalam wa Yes. Um, my question is, uh, when are for men wudu? I see some people like pass wet hands over their socks, like you call it like uh, as in the hospital, which was during the time of the prophet, like people used to do that. Okay. And also I have a second question. Uh, during Salah, there's this sitting, like after, after the sujood, like people sit before they rise up, like for two or three seconds. I don't know whether you understand the yes, sitting yes, I'm yes. talking about. Uh, like I understand. In the tashud, yes. I but you want to know what's uh, behind that. Is it okay to do it or is it uh, against Islam? Okay, any more questions? No, that's all. Okay, Noor. I will answer you, inshallah. Okay, uh, Sister Om Hamza from Saudi. Hello, Assalamu alaikum, Sheikh. Assalamu alaikum, Barakatu. Sheikh, I have three questions. Yes. Uh, my first question is that if uh, a woman takes ghusl, uh, after her uh, period, after her monthly periods, and after taking ghusl, she notices that there's a slight uh, nail polish still uh, on her nails, maybe like one millimeter or two millimeters. Will the ghusl be void, and does she have to take the ghusl again, or will it be considered okay? Okay. And second the question is, uh, if there's a stepmother and she is having very good relationship with her stepkids, but they are not behaving well such that the stepmother is no more able to pray for them. She, like, she doesn't feel like praying for them anymore. Is there a spin on the mother? Okay. Like, she, she's not making dua anymore for the kids because of the behavior. Okay. And third question is, is there any sin in saying uh, to a person that may he be rewarded or uh, punished as per what he is doing to me? Okay. Okay. Do we have any more questions? Okay. Hamid uh, from Saudi Arabia, second question. He says that his wife knows the ruling on the prohibition from going out after Maghrib. And to me, the husband would go, wow, I hope this curfew goes on till Fajr. So he's asking. She says, okay, can we go for a walk after Isha? Akhi Hamid, the prohibition is disputed upon among scholars. Is it prohibited or is it makruh? The majority say it's makruh, it's not haram. But it is not addressed to all. It is addressed only to the infants and to the children to go out after sunset until the Adhan of Isha. 
So this is the time which is approximately an hour, an hour plus, where the children are not to be let out unattended. But if you want to go with your child to the park at, after Maghrib, or you want to go shopping, or you want to visit someone, it's okay because you are with him. The Prophet justified this Islam because the shayateeni intisharan wa khatfa. This time of the day, or actually of the night, is when the devils spread and they do their heinous work, such as kidnapping, possession uh, of people, etc. And this is for the children. So if you and your wife would like to go out and take a walk, do shopping after Maghrib, there's no problem in doing so at all, inshallah. Noor from Nigeria, he says, what's the ruling on wiping over the hoof, which includes the shoes, the socks you wear? Because when performing wudu, we see some people with wet hands simply wipe over their socks or shoes. So is this permissible? The answer is yes. It is part, it's an essential part of Ahlus Sunnah wal Jama'ah that wiping over the socks or the shoes or the khuf or the jarmuq or the muq, different names for it. Whatever you wear on your feet and that covers the whole foot plus the ankles, you can wipe only on the top of it and do that once. Providing that you put on these socks while you were in the state of wudu. So if you pray Fajr and you're still in the state of wudu, and at 10 o'clock, uh, let's assume, and you are still in the state of wudu, you did not break your wudu, you put on your socks and go to work, and then you answer the call of nature, you pass wind, you break your wudu for one reason or the other. Dhuhr time is due, you go and perform wudu. When it comes to washing the feet, it is sufficient for you to just wipe over it. And you can do this for 24 hours from the time you wipe over your socks. If you are a resident, but if you're traveling, Allah has given you 72 hours, three days and three nights, to wipe without the need of washing your feet, unless you have a, a major uh, ritual impurity. In this case, you have to take a full bath and you have to wash your feet. We have a, a caller, Muhammad from Saudi. Hey. Yes, brother Muhammad. Uh, Assalamu alaikum, Shaykh. Assalamu rahmatullah. Uh, Shay, I have two questions, Shay. Yes. One is, is it allowed for Muslims um, to give a sakat, not sadaka, sakat to Peace TV and uh, the other one uh, to the mosque instead of giving to the relatives? And second question is, Shay, in the UK there is an Islamic mortgage. Is it allowed for Muslims to take the Islamic mortgage? These are my two questions, Shay. Thank you very much, Shay. You're quite welcome, Akhi. Uh, Sister Thwaiba? from Nigeria. Sister Thwaiba. Okay, we lost Sister Thwaiba. Uh, Brother Noor's second question, he's asking about the authenticity and the pers uh, permissibility of performing what is known as Jalsatul Istiraha. What is Jalsatul Istiraha? It is backed by the Hadith of Malik ibn al-Huwayrith which was reported in Sahih al-Bukhari. And this gives it the highest degree of authenticity. And he said to his companions, among them, the companions of the Prophet ﷺ, after the death of the Prophet, of course. He said, shall I perform to you the Prophet's prayer, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, as he used to pray it? So he prayed for rakahs in front of him, them, and they were watching. After he finished the first rakah, and he offered two prostrations for the first rak'ah before standing up for a second rak'ah. And also he did the same thing before standing up for the fourth rak'ah. So he performed this jalsa to istiraha which is a short pause, the duration of two to three seconds. After you raise your head from the second prostration, from the first or the third rak'ah, you do not stand up immediately, but rather have this short pause, and then you stand up to the second or to the fourth rakah. And after he concluded the prayer, none of the, his companions or the companions of the Prophet ﷺ objected by saying, no, this is something that the Prophet did not do. So from this hadith, 
Imam Shafi'i and the Shafi'i school stated that this is highly recommended because it is the des description of the Prophet's prayer وسلم, and no companion opposed it or rejected it. Now, other schools of thought say that you should not do it and they depend on the hadith of Wa'il ibn Hujr, may Allah be pleased with him, that the Prophet ﷺ used to uh, uh, pray other than this. So it depends on the school of thought you follow. It depends on what you think and believe that is more authentic. Is it Sahih al-Bukhari or the Sunan, for example, of Ibn Majah, etc. So those who follow this uh, uh, hadith of Malik ibn al-Huayrith, such as Sheikh al-Albani, and a great number of scholars say that the hadith is crystal clear. So we follow it and we take it as it is. And those who don't simply wouldn't do it. And it's not a big issue of dispute. You want to pray like this, go ahead. You don't want to pray and follow the sunnah. Your prayer is still valid. It's like the dispute between Hanafis and the rest of the world in raising the hands and saying, Allahu Akbar or Sami Allah Alimin Hamidah. They make an issue out of it, and this, there's no issue. If you want to follow this sunnah, alhamdulillah, if you don't believe it's a sunnah, don't do it, akhi. Your prayer is still valid, inshallah. We have... Okay, uh, uh, Sister Thwayba? No, um, salam alaikum. Salam wa rahmatullah. No, um, yeah. Uh, my question is on uh, uh, tubal ligation. I have a friend who was to undergo tubal ligation. She is not sure if, uh, 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 so I'm not sure if it's allowed in Islam. What, what, what is not allowed? What are you, what's your question about? It's about tubal ligation. About what? Tying the tube, fallopian tube, as a means of permanent uh, family planning. Tying the tube, fallopian tube. Oh, so so he uh, she does not want to have children. Sister Twaiba, is it to do with uh, having children? Yes, yes, Fam uh, family planning, yani. Yeah, is this planning or cutting it off completely? Tying it up, tying it up. You tie the the, the fallopian tube, tie it up. It's a permanent family planning. It's permanent. Okay. I will answer you, inshallah. Uh, we have a caller. Japan from Gambia. Yeah. Yes, so Japan. Japan. Yes, Akhi. Uh, do you, I want to ask one question. This, this Western are making Muslim very tired now. Mm. Do, okay. Should we keep on sitting down to look them like that or what? You're referring to uh, the Christians uh, uh, oppressing the Muslims? Uh, okay. Okay. They are oppressing the Muslims right now. Should we sit down to look them like that or what? Okay. I will answer you, inshallah. Okay. Uh, um Hamza, she says that if a woman after performing her ghusl, her major ritual purity, after being uh, uh, purified from her menses. So afterwards she discovers that there is a small portion that has a nail polish on it. So is she obliged to perform a ghusl again? If this was close to her actual ghusl, in our madhab, in our school of thought, the Hanbali school of thought, she can do half of the ghusl at a particular time and three, four hours finish the other half. And this is not authentic. Though it's in our school of thought, but this is unacceptable. It has to be in a sequence. But if such a little minute thing took place and it was in the vicinity of half an hour or an hour, then yes, you can... Uh, remove this nail polish and just wash it and inshallah it does the job because there are some scholars and this is not the majority opinion some scholars said that the little najasa and the little the very little and minute area that was not touched by water is forgiven 
However, personally, I would always recommend my daughters to remove it and to do their ghusl once again. It's always best to be safe rather than to be sorry. Uh, we have, okay, so uh, we have a short break, stay tuned, and inshallah, we'll be right back. Assalamu alaikum and welcome back. Um Hamza from Saudi Arabia had a second question, and her question was, if a stepmother who is kind to her stepchildren, uh, but unfortunately she's the wife of their father, so sometimes they misbehave, they abuse her, they don't give her the necessary respect, though she goes out of her way to be kind to them. So after a while, it becomes a burden to her to raise her hands and say, Oh Allah, give them good health. Oh Allah, guide them. Oh Allah, have mercy on them. So she says, I do not curse them. I do not pray against them. But I do not pray for them. Am I sinful? The answer is no. Definitely you're not sinful for not praying for someone. However, it's a higher grade. It's a higher level where you far surpass yourself by giving and making good da'wah for those who are bad to you. And Allah Azza wa Jal, and you have to always keep this in mind. Whenever you make du'a for them, Allah appoints an angel who replies to you and say, and to you as well. So when you say, may Allah guide you, my stepchildren, the angel says, and to you. And this also cascades to your own children if you have children of your own. So don't give away this great uh, reward. We have a caller. Atiq from Oman. Assalamu alaikum. Salam to Allah. Uh, Sheikh, this is Muhammad Atiq from Oman. Actually, I'm from a Hindi, uh, you know, Indian Muslim. Yes, Sahih. Um, I have a question. Mm -hmm. You told that uh, praying behind Barelvi, you know, Barelvi people. Okay. Back in India and Pakistan, they believe in, you know, Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu is alive and he is hazir, one hazir and all this stuff. Okay. So praying behind them is, uh, it is actually, you know, you, you told that, I have heard your you know, answer, one of the answers, uh, some of the last uh, programs, that you told that praying behind them, avoid, please avoid praying behind them, actually. Okay. So what about their zabiha? What about the butcher? You know, I, if I go to butcher shop, actually I'm in Oman. There are a lot of butcheries here. You have all Pakistanis. Okay. And their Akhida, I know. And their, uh, their manhaj, I know. They are Barilviya. Can we eat their Zabiha? Can we eat their, you know, slaughter uh, meat? Okay. Any questions? Any more questions? Yeah, this one. This one only. Thank okay. you very much. Jazakum Allah. Wa Jazak, Akhi. from Saudi. Abdul Rauf, Brother Abdul Rauf from Saudi Arabia? Yes, yes, speaking. Uh, good evening, Sheikh. Good evening to you, Akhi. Sheikh, I have two questions this evening. Uh, the first question is, I want to know about, uh, can we assist non-Muslim friends with the money which is uh, earned through the riba? I, I didn't get your question. My question is, is it allowed in Islam to assist your non-Muslim friends uh, from the money which is earned through the interest, through the riba. Who's, who's get, getting the riba, you or your friends? No. For example, if I have some money in the bank, I'm earning interest on that money. And okay. I, if I wanted to share it with my non-Muslim friends, is it allowed? As a gift or as a, as a, 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 a loan? Uh, need. Abdurrauf, is it a gift or a loan? No, it's a gift. Okay, I will answer you. Second question. And my second question is, some of my colleagues, uh, when they stand uh, before the Father's prayer, they just see one minute is uh, or a half minute, and then they start praying for the Kasunda. And they are missing the important uh, factor of the prayer, which is Takbir-i or one Rakat or two Rakat from the Father. 
This is after the Iqamah has been given? No, when there is no, the congregational prayer is about to start, they start praying for four o'clock before the prayer starts, the Jama'ah prayer. Okay. So is it... Um, do they the finish it? Do, such kind of do they finish it before the Iqamah? No, they do, they, they do not finish it before the Iqamah. Okay, okay. I get your question. Any more questions? No, thank you, Sheikh. Jazakallah khair. Brother Ismail from Sudan. Yes, please. Salaam wa rahmatullah. I have two questions. Yes, sir. The, the first question is, suppose if a person, a Muslim, Your line is breaking, yeah, Ismail. I, I did not hear your question. Your line is breaking. Okay, I say that in our country here, because we are here mixed up with the Christian, now one will imitate the life of the Christian and say that in my day, somebody must play music throughout the day, throughout the night, maybe for three days like this. Is it good for, for the person behind here to, to keep on that promise? This is the first question. The second question is, now, for example, we shall say that we are making contribution, then a, ch a church is mission like this will say that you give us your contribution to support the Trinity. Is it allowed for us, the Muslims, to contribute there? To support what? God bless. To support, suppose they say that you support our Trinity, the three gods. The oh, Christians okay. Believe. Yeah, they say that what, what support is, by contributing. What is the, the, the first question? The first question is, a person dies, and then say that before he dies, he said that if I die, you people must allow people to play music the whole night for three consecutive days. And he's Muslim? Rather night. Is it allowed? He was a Muslim? Yeah, a Muslim, a Muslim person. And he tells Thanks. that the people pray the whole night for him? Yes, must he play the music, the music. Music? Oh. Yeah, things, yeah. Okay. Thank I will answer you, inshallah. Okay, Doke. Um, um Hamza's third question Is it permissible to say to a person, May Allah reward you or punish you? Again, it comes back to dua. Why would you say such a statement? Usually, you would not say to someone, May Allah punish you, unless he has done you wrong. And definitely, may Allah reward you. This is uh, a rhetorical and hypothetical because if he had done you wrong, you would not ask Allah to reward him. So actually, you're asking Allah Azza to punish him. And why would you do something like that? Allah Azza wa says, لا يحب الله الجهر بالسوء من القول إلا من ظلم. Allah Azza wa does not like people to announce foul language or something that is bad, except when being oppressed. So if someone oppresses you, you may make dua against him, and this is your right. But it is recommended, which is a higher level, to forgive and to let go. But if you want to make dua, you go ahead. However, you have to be fair, so you don't kill a mosquito with a cannon. If he took uh, uh, $10 of you, this is an oppression. You don't say, may Allah Azza wa Jal kill all of your children and make your wife a widow. Th this is too much. This is transgression and dua. So it is always best to ask Allah Azza wa Jal, as Nabi Allah Nuh said, inni maghloobun fantasir. Oh Allah, I'm being oppressed, so avenge me. That's it. And Allah Azza wa Jal, is up to him, subhanahu wa ta'ala, who is fair and just to give the correct portion of punishment to that person Allah knows best. Uh, we have a caller, uh, Sister Shaheen from Saudi. Yeah, assalamu alaikum, Sheikh. Assalamu alaikum, Sheikh. Yeah, I had a question. Uh, I have a one year old infant, and uh, while I'm offering salah, uh, he's always, uh, you know, playing around, and uh, I'm, uh, there's a fear that he may do something, uh, you know, harmful to him. Uh, ha he may harm himself. So during the salah, can I uh, 
I mean, uh, divert here and there. I, can I ha look at him uh, and continue my salah at the same time? Okay. So, uh, does that break my salah if I look at him okay. while he's doing something which may harm him? Got it. Second question? No, I, uh, just this one. Okay. I will answer, inshallah. Uh, Sister Alima from Pakistan. Uh, Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah sheikh. Wa alaikum assalam wa barakatuh. Um, sheikh, I've only got one question to ask. Mm -hmm. uh, is, that, is it that a uh, wudu is nullified if we look at a person whose aura is not properly covered? Okay, I will answer your question, inshallah. Okay. So, Brother Muhammad from Saudi Arabia, he says that it is it permissible to give zakat money to Peace TV? It's an issue of dispute whether it is permissible to give zakat for means of da'wah, like Islamic channels, like Islamic da'wah offices, like printing of leaflets. And the reason for such a dispute is that Allah mentioned in verse 60, Chapter 9, Surah at tawbah Eight categories of those entitled for receiving zakat. And the last one, Allah says, وَفِي سَبِيلِ اللَّهِ So سَبِيلِ اللَّهِ is a wide term that scholars differed when interpreting. Some said, سَبِيلِ اللَّهِ when compared to the seven previous categories of zakat recipients, refers only to jihad. Others said, no, sabilillah is open. The second or the latter opinion is definitely not right. Sabilillah is only for jihad. But again, they differed when they said that jihad is not only isolated or limited to fighting in the cause of Allah. Why do people do jihad? To call others to Allah. So if they answer or if they allowed the da'wah to be spread in their countries, there's no need to fight. There's no problem. So the essence of jihad is calling others to the religion of Allah, to Islam. And this also includes the categories of da'wah, such as TV channels, publications, etc. So the scholars differed. Some of them said, no, zakat can only be given to physical jihad, the one we know, fighting the disbelievers. And others said that it is permissible, such as Sheikh Abdullah ibn Jibrain, one of the great scholars of contemporary time, may Allah have mercy on his soul. He said that it is permissible, and among others of the major scholars of Islam in Saudi Arabia and elsewhere. So it is an issue of dispute. Those who follow this opinion find it easy to give them zakat. Those who say that no, it should only be given to the physical actual jihad, and this is the opinion that I adopt, say you cannot give zakat and Allah Azawajal knows best. We have a caller. Uh, we have Abdul Rahman from the UK. Allah barakatuh. Yes, Abdul Rahman. Yeah, Abdul Rahman. Hello? Yes, Akhi, what can I do for you? Is student finance haram if you are not eligible to pay tuition fee? Is student loans haram? Yeah, if you, is student finance haram if you are not eligible to pay tuition fees? I didn't get the first word. Is what haram? Is student finance haram if okay. you are not eligible to pay tuition fees? Okay. Any more questions? No, that, that's all. Brother Saad from uh, Saudi. Assalamu alaikum, sir. Assalamu rahmatullah. Uh, I have two questions. Yes. Uh, first question, I have four school of thought, like Imam Shafi, Imam Hamdali, and uh, two more imams. So is it necessary to follow any one imam, or is it uh, okay to follow... Uh, or Bilal Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Hadith. And my second question is uh, now in Islam there are many sects who are pertaining or claiming to be a Sunnah and uh, Quran. So whom should we follow? Okay. 
Thank you, sir. Jazakallah khair. Wa Okay, I think we will not take any more questions. And let us try to answer in five minutes uh, these uh, great list of questions. Thuwaybe from Nigeria, she says, what's the ruling on permanently uh, restricting reproduction by tying the uh, uh, fallopian tube or whatever they call it? I'm, I'm, I'm not very well acquainted with such medical terms. It's prohibited to permanently uh, stop reproduction, whether from the man's side or from the woman's side, unless there's a legitimate reason. And a true legitimate reason would be that the doctors say, if you get pregnant or conceive again, you will die. You have a problem with your uh, um, body, with your health, and you have to stop. In such cases, we have to look into case-to-case -case scenario. But generally speaking, one says, listen, I have three kids, that's it. I want to call it a day. I want to permanently stop uh, uh, having children. This is not permissible. G uh, Japan from Gambia says, what's the ruling when the Christians are oppressing the Muslims? Should we just sit back and watch? Uh, this depends on the country and, and on the environment. The Prophet ﷺ, when he was 13 years in Mecca, he did not raise any type of weapon or objection or violence. He was not permitted to do jihad. So they used to oppress them, you, they used to attack the Muslims, and he would refrain and tell the Muslims to refrain. Because if they did otherwise, the mushrik would have annihilated the whole of the Muslims at the time. When he moved to Medina, and they had the power and the means to defend themselves, not only that, to attack as well, they initiated this in the cause of Allah Azza wa Jal with justice and fairness. So I don't know about the uh, uh, situation in Gambia, but I believe that, if I'm not mistaken, Gambia is a Muslim country. And the ruler is uh, uh, a Muslim ruler as well, who graduated, I think, from uh, um, an Islamic university. And hence, they cannot oppress the Muslims, as you say. So there are always the authorities to go and complain to. There are always your scholars, real scholars of Al-Sunnah al jamaah who can give you uh, uh, good and sound advice. Because to me, I'm an outsider. I don't know about the situation. I don't know even where the country is or what's the rulings uh, 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 there. So I'm not qualified to give you uh, a sound advice. But if you were the minority there, you have to be tolerant and patient and try to spread the da'wah softly and try not to be confrontational. Don't go head on because you are the weakest link. So uh, uh, make dua that Allah changes it. Muhammad Atiq says, what's the ruling on praying behind the br Brilvis? The Brilvis, the Daubandis, and all these sects, if they claim that they're Muslims and say, La ilaha illallah Muhammad Rasulullah, they are Muslims. You can pray behind them unless you know that this specific individual says something that is kufr something that nullifies Islam. In this case, you may not pray behind him. Likewise, the butcher shops. If he is Brelvi or Daubandi, maybe he is not having any of the conviction that nullifies Islam. He's just a layman. He doesn't know what's happening. So unless you know for sure that he believes that the Prophet knows the unseen or the Prophet controls the universe and he's Hazar Nazar and he's not dead and he's traveling left, right and center, unless you know for sure that he believes this, in this case, you may eat from his dhabiha as well. Abdul Rauf from Saudi says, what's the ruling on giving the interest money to non-Muslims? You can give it to Muslim charity. There's no problem in giving it away. The problem is in earning it. Uh, he says, what is the ruling on people who start the voluntary prayer just before the iqama? If they can catch the imam before he gives the first takbir, then it's okay. But if they are going to delay joining the imam due to their nafila, they should break it and join him. Ismail from Sudan says, what's the ruling on giving money to uh, Christians who support Trinity? This is kufr. This is an act of apostasy. And what's the ruling on a person who give, writes a will that they play music while uh, um, uh, taking him to the grave during his funeral? He's a nutcase. Nut uh, may Allah Azza wa Jal 
guide him before he dies because this is a sin. Shaheen from Saudi, he, she says that my son is a, a one year old, so can I look at him while I'm praying? You can look at him, but you must not turn away from the Qibla. The minute you turn away from the Qibla, your prayer becomes a void. Uh, Alima from uh, Pakistan, she says, is it true that if I look at the awra, the private part of someone else, this breaks my wudu? The answer is no. As long as there is no sexual arousing and there is no discharge, then your wudu is intact, but looking at such a awra is not permissible. Abdurrahman from the UK says, what's the ruling on financing uh, uh, studying in the UK as long as we're not obliged to pay riba? This is not happening. They make you sign on a paper that if your salary exceeds 21,000 pounds, I think, uh, per year, then you're obliged to pay riba. And by signing this, you're approving a major sin, even if you are certain that you will never reach that salary. The approval itself is like signing a paper that you authorize him to rape your sister, though you know that you're not going to go that far. The approval itself is a sin and this is not permissible. Finally, Sa'ad says, uh, what's the ruling on following one of the imams of the four schools of thought or the Prophet ﷺ? This is hypothetical. They're all following the Prophet ﷺ. But to come and say, I will ignore all four schools of thought and I will only follow the Quran and Sunnah, you have to be in their level. Yes, if you're a student of knowledge and you know fluent Arabic and you have the necessary tools to look into their schools of thought and filter it and reach what, you, what, what is most likely to be authentic according to the Quran and Sunnah with the understanding of the Salaf, then go ahead. Other than that, no, it is uh, 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 preposterous to just ignore all the Salaf and all the schools of thought and just depend on your own intellect thinking that you know. And finally, who should we follow? There are so many sects and cults around us. You, Akhi, this is a $100 uh, a million dollar question that requires a thorough answer, and which we don't have time for. But look for a scholar who you trust his iman, his knowledge, his moral conduct, uh, his righteousness. And you trust him in whatever he says and follow him. And he, inshallah, will guide you to Jannah and Allah Azza wa Jal knows best. This is all the time we have until we meet you inshallah Saturday, my time. And that is between Maghrib and Isha, Saudi time. I leave you fi amanillah. Wassalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Allah is my heart's speech. Your mercy is what I beseech. Keep in my heart your remembrance and in your deen allow me to advance. Help me in my quest. Permit me to pass the altar.